Hello friends, welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. This is an ongoing series, so if you haven't seen the previous ones yet, feel free to click the little card above and catch up for some context, but otherwise, let's hop into things. This is it. The final dungeon of Skyward Sword. But first is the matter of getting there, so buckle up because there is a lot to do before the game's finale. We have successfully tempered our sword into the Master Sword, which means we can achieve our goal of activating the Gate of Time, but not before another battle against the Imprisoned, this time with arms. We'll also find that Groose has constructed this rail-based catapult and will assist during the battle here by flinging giant bombs at the imprisoned's face. Nice. Though the battle goes pretty much the same as last time. Beat the spike down into his skull a few times, and he'll be resealed. Now we can head back to the temple and activate the Gate of Time. Doing so will allow us to travel back in time through the gate to the ancient past where Zelda has gone with Impa. There's a pretty big dump of exposition here, but here's the gist. As explained in the game's prologue, the goddess Hylia had once battled the demon king Demise. She could only seal him, and knowing he would break free, she devised a plan. First, she created Phi to act as a guide to her chosen hero. Then, she shed her divine form and reincarnated herself as a mortal. If you haven't put the pieces together yet, well, Link here is that chosen hero, and Zelda is the goddess Hylia reborn. She blesses the Master Sword, unlocking its true power, and then puts herself in a coma which will keep the seal on Demise intact, which it mostly has, but Demise just happens to be that imprisoned monstrosity that we've had to beat back into submission twice already, so despite all of this, we will need to still put an end to Demise completely. In order to do so, we'll have to find the Triforce itself. Oh yeah, this is something the game has actually been teasing out to us, and it's even clarified in Zelda's dialogue. As we've completed the many trials and hardships through our adventure, we've slowly proven ourselves worthy of wielding that sacred power. We've proven our courage by facing our fears, wisdom by solving dastardly puzzles, and power by defeating terrifying foes and tempering our sword. Now, all that remains is to find the Triforce itself, which is said to have been sent up to Skyloft by Hylia, along with the people of the surface all those years ago, so we'll have to find someone on Skyloft who may know of the Triforce's whereabouts. And who else would we consult but Headmaster Gipora, aka Zelda's dad. At first he's of no help as he doesn't know the Triforce's whereabouts, but then he recalls that there is someone who may, the great sky spirit Levias, who should be found in the Thunderhead. So Gipora suggests that we speak to instructor Aulin to find out info on how to find Levias. Aulin will tell us that while we can find Levias in the Thunderhead, that something seems to be wrong with him. His usual joyful eyes are filled with malice, and Levias seems to attack all who draw near. Owlin suspects Levias to be possessed by some evil, and suggests that we have to go talk to someone else to find out more, specifically the owner of the Lumpy Pumpkin. But first, he'll teach us this spiral charge technique, which is pretty much the exact same as the dash attack that we already have, but okay. Going to talk to the owner of the Lumpy Pumpkin, he'll tell us that he usually gives an annual offering of pumpkin soup to Levias, but hasn't yet this year, and asks us to take a batch of soup over. Using Scrapper, we can carry the soup into the Thunderhead and drop it off at this Rainbow Island, which will cause Levias to appear. This initiates a two-phase boss battle, and I kinda love it. Levias will have these tentacle eyeball things sticking out of him, which we can attack with our Loftwing. It's pretty straightforward, but Levias does move pretty quick for such a big guy. Once they're all done, we can dive onto Levias's back, and we'll have to deal with the second phase of the battle. The creature possessing Levias will reveal itself. This is Bilokite. During the battle, Bilokite will spit these sort of acid balls at you, which you can deflect back, but rather than using your shield parry to do so, you'll want to use your sword so that you can aim it in the proper direction. So in a way, this is your classic match of Dead Man's Volley, with a twist. You'll want to strike each side of his face once, then hit his eye, then go stabby stab time. Rinse, 
repeat. You can also just forego this and shoot him with your bow, but it's a little trickier to do so since you have to be quick. Not the most amazing boss battle in the game, but I love it for a couple of reasons. First, the fight actually makes use of your Loftwing. I love this big old bird, but he is so underutilized in the game, aside from just flapping around the sky between dungeons. Second, Dead Man's Volley is always fun, and third, it's just pretty cool to do a boss fight in the sky like this. The atmosphere and the music are pretty great here too. Once Bilokite is defeated, Levias will return to his normal, sane state of mind. He'll tell us that in order to find the Triforce, oh, there's a bunch of stuff to do. We'll need to find the three parts of the Song of the Hero, which we can learn from the three dragons on the surface. You can do the three parts of this quest in any order that you'd like, but in short, you'll need to travel to the three provinces of the surface and find those dragons. I like to head to Laneru first, which I'll explain why in a moment, but it's my favorite of the three regions. We'll run into this Goron guy who says he's uncovered a new path in that previous tunnel to where a dragon is said to live. Oh, hey, that's really helpful. Thanks, not Gorko. We can enter Laneru Gorge and find... Oh, the dragon is dead. However, this is still the Laneru province, which means there are sure to be some time shift stones around. If we follow this chain that he's holding, we can find a key which opens this door, through which we'll find a minecart with a time shift stone on it. We can activate it, causing the minecart to start moving, and there's this great obstacle course that circles around the gorge, which involves a lot of using the claw shots to keep up with the minecart. Eventually, it will circle back, and the time shift area of effect will be increased by this machine, encompassing the entire gorge. Now in the past, we'll find the thunder dragon Laneru who is pretty sick, hence him being dead in the present. He tells us that the robots had planted a seed nearby to grow a tree of life, but it can't grow in this region. However, we can take the seed, head to the lush Pharon region, pass through the gate of time, and plant it in the past so that in the present day it's a full tree. Now we can harvest this giant life fruit and give it to Laneru to cure him. He'll teach you his part of the song and in addition to that, offer a side quest to you. You can do a boss rush challenge with him, which will earn us the Hylian shield itself, which is the only unbreakable shield in the game, so it's well worth getting. Which is why I like to do this section first. I just want to get this thing as soon as I possibly can. If we head over to Pharon before we go see the dragon, we'll actually have to battle the imprisoned for a third and final time, which is the most thrilling of the three battles with him. Bruce will actually launch you onto the prison's head in order to drive the ceiling spike into it again. Oh, that's just fantastic. It's pretty exhilarating. Gruus will give us a lift into the woods and we'll find it to be flooded. We can swim into the inside of the great tree and find the water dragon who will want to test us before teaching us her part of the song. Didn't we already help you improve ourselves? Come on! So we have to swim around the entire flooded province collecting these tad tones. This is pretty easy, although somewhat tedious, though if you're having trouble with the long-term swimming, you can buy an air potion in Skyloft to give yourself a few extra minutes underwater without having to worry about drowning. Even so, the tad tones do refill your air gauge as you collect them, plus there's all these air bubbles around, so you'll be just fine without the potion. Once they're all collected, Pharaon will teach us her part of the song. Last is my least favorite section of this quest. If we head over to Elden, we'll find the volcano erupting, which somehow causes us to be captured by Bokoblins and stripped of all of our items. What the heck? Plants will show up and give us our Mogma mitts back, and then we have to do this lengthy stealth section. Okay, I know that our sword is gone, but why can't I just punch a Bokoblin in the face with these mitts on? That would hurt! We'll have to sneak around the Elden Province gathering our equipment. Once we have it all, we'll find this cave where the Fire Dragon Elden lives. We can use the beetle to cut these ropes and lower the bridge, just like in the Earth Temple, and learn the final part of the song from the Fire Dragon. Now, with all three parts of the song, we can return to Levias who will teach us the song in its totality, which allows for us to douse for a trial gate, leading us to a Silent Realm trial here on Skyloft. Though if I'm being honest, maybe it's just due to the terrain not being all that dangerous, but this is probably the easiest of the four Silent Realm trials. Once the trial is completed, we'll be rewarded with this red gem called the Stone of Trials, which Fi tells us is one of a pair. We can find its match set in the eye of this statue, and in Inserting the stone in place here will cause the statue to open, firing a cannon at the Isle of the Goddess, which takes a moment before reacting. The Isle quakes, stone breaks away, revealing the entrance to the dungeon right below the statue of the Goddess where our journey began. We can use the claw shots here to make our way over and head into 
the dungeon. Finally. Welcome to Skykeep, the final dungeon in the game, as well as probably the most unique dungeon conceptually. Its progression structure is wildly variable, meaning your own experience and the order of rooms you tackle will probably be pretty different from playthrough to playthrough. The reason for this is, while many other dungeons have contained some great puzzles, above all else, this dungeon is the puzzle. Literally, and it isn't a simple one either. The dungeon is going to make you stop frequently just to think about and plan out your navigation, and it is wonderful. In about half of the dungeon's rooms are these consoles, labeled in Hylian script as control panels, where you can move these panels around. Each panel represents a room in the dungeon, so as you make your way through the dungeon, you have to rearrange the very rooms of the dungeon itself. Sliding block puzzles certainly aren't new to Zelda, but a sliding block dungeon? This is some next level creativity. If you know what you're doing, this can cause the dungeon to be pretty short. There's a total of only 8 rooms, but you can easily get lost and spend a great deal of time pushing these rooms around and hitting dead ends. Most of the progression can be done in any order, but there are a few exceptions. For example, you always will enter in the foyer room, and because of this arrangement, the second room will pretty much always be the same. There's also a single locked door in the dungeon in this room, so you have to make sure you go through this room which has a chest with the key before that. Meanwhile this room is gated off from the west side, meaning that you have to always enter from the east side. But aside from those few instances, the sheer flexibility of it all, the varying order of its progression, that's what I find so brilliant about this dungeon. The dungeon does what many final Zelda dungeons do, which is infusing elements of all the dungeons we've done up until now, with each room containing elements from one of the dungeons we've already completed. However, there are seven dungeons in the game, including this one, and eight rooms, meaning some clever design choices have to be made to make up for that two dungeon discrepancy. And even then, some elements sneak into each other's rooms, like these statues that were only found in Laneru province are in the Earth Temple themed room, and there are also underground tunnel sections in that room which were only found in the Fire Sanctuary. The Skyview Temple themed room mixes elements from Skyview with the architecture and structures from the ancient cistern. Meanwhile, another room is entirely dedicated just to that dungeon's basement, and another room seems to be themed after the inside of the giant tree in Faron Woods, but with a mid-boss fight that is pretty much the exact same as the one in the sand ship. So despite each room appearing at first to be based on one specific dungeon, it actually mixes a lot of these elements together to give us several rooms that are something more unique. These rooms also make great use of Link's entire arsenal, with the exception of the net and maybe the slingshot, which are the two items found outside of dungeons. Every other item gets put to use in some way in here, sometimes in familiar ways, sometimes combined with other elements. It's great. Architecture-wise, as I stated already, the rooms are all modeled after the previous dungeons, mostly. The foyer room, as well as a few special rooms, are their own, and shares their aesthetics with places like the Sword Chamber and the Isle of Songs, but here with depictions of the Triforce and the goddess Hylia. The Triforce appears on all the doors in a fitting gold mural. These torches have this winged design as well, which calls back to many of the save statues that we've seen, including this one in the foyer. But mostly, I just love these beautiful murals of the goddess. Aside from these few rooms though, it's all just callbacks to other dungeons with minor tweaks. I think I would have preferred it if the dungeon retained this distinct visual identity and aesthetic all throughout its 
entirety, perhaps retaining the diversity of gameplay mechanics, but keeping the architecture all in line and unified. But ultimately, the diversity of the architecture helps each room to stand out better, so it does make sense why they did this from a gameplay perspective. You more or less have to learn each room pretty well if you're going to make it through here, and so having them all be so distinct from each other makes a big difference. The music of Skykeep borrows the tracks of the previous dungeons, with a couple of exceptions. It excludes my favorite track, that's the Ancient Cisterns Upstairs theme, as well as the outdoor themes of the Sand Ship. But it has the rest of them, including the Ancient Cisterns Basement theme, the Sand Ship's interior themes, and the tracks from the rest of the dungeons. The Dangerous Skyview theme, the Absolute Bop that is the Earth Temple's theme, etc. These are all used in their corresponding rooms, of course. Meanwhile, the Sky Keep's own rooms get their own theme as well. This brilliant, majestic piece. The track is incredibly mysterious and ambient, with high-pitched choirs carrying most of the weight here, but loads of companion instruments to round out the sound here, including what sounds like some harp strings to match your own harp. It's just got this very sacred and uneasy feel to it, and I adore it. Okay, let's talk about the progression through this place. Because of the nature of Skykeep, I'm going to present these rooms to you in mostly the order that I went through them during this playthrough. But that order is not a set order. You may tackle things differently, and that's sort of the beauty of it. I will say one thing as a tip though. When using these control panels to rearrange the dungeon, try to do so from a corner room. Whichever room you are in won't move. So if you're in the center of this 3x3 grid, then you're just going to be shuffling the rooms around like this and making no progress. Planting yourself in a corner and arranging the dungeon from there is your best bet. Okay, we'll enter this gorgeous foyer room with this sky era architecture that I just adore. Right away in the center of the room, we'll find a chest which contains the dungeon map. Our objectives will be marked on the map right away, with these three golden triangles indicating where we can find the three pieces of the Triforce. So right away, we know where we need to go. It's just a matter of getting there. The gate ahead will open, giving us access to the first control panel, which we'll have to try out using right away or we won't be able to make any progress, since the first door leads to nowhere currently. Based on the default layout, there isn't actually much we can do with this, aside from moving a couple of panels, but we can connect to these two rooms, then head through the door. This takes us into the Skyview Temple themed room, though admittedly the architecture is more of a combination of the Pharaon Woods itself mixed with the upper floor of the Ancient Cistern. The path branches here. The left path is gated, so we'll have to head right instead. There's some Deku Babas to fight, and we'll reach this chasm. Before you swing across, you'll need to untether the rope on the other side, which you can do with the beetle. Then you can use the whip to swing over, catch the rope, and land on the other side. Side. Battle this Skulchula, then we'll find some rotating pillars like we saw in the Ancient Cistern. You can snipe the Furnix here with your bow, and before moving on you may want to deal with the Pyrups on the other end of the room, which you can defeat with either the bow or by using the beetle to grab a bomb and blow them up. Then hookshot over to the first pillar, then the second, then over to this platform. You can swing on this rope to reach the suspended platforms, which we can then use the Gust Bellows to move and jump over to the ledge. We can pull this lever to open open the gate here, which creates a shortcut back to that first door, just in case we end up having to cross through this room again. Then let's head through the next door. If you moved both rooms already, then we should end up in the Lanayru Mining Facility themed room. Though it uses the architecture and theme music from that dungeon, its design is actually more akin to the pirate stronghold. There's a time shift orb that we'll need to carry through here to remove some barriers. Then we can open this hatch with the lever above and toss this stone onto the conveyor belt, since you can't carry it up the ladder. We'll then want to place it on this rotor platform and stand to the side and use the gust bellows to move it to the other end of the room. You will need to be on the ledge here to hold this switch down while you do it. When it's at the other end of the track, it should remove a barricade here so we can shoot this eye switch. Then we'll bring it into the next section. We can open a shortcut gate here like we did in the last room as well. Toss it into the next conveyor belt then while it's moving and you can strike the five eye switches along the wall as the time shift area of effect removes the barricades. Just watch out as it also revives these Beemos. Doing so correctly should unlock this gate to the next control panel. You can shuffle the rooms again here, so I recommend next shuffling it into this configuration so that we have a clear path towards that treasure chest. Okay, we can cut back through the Skyview room quickly and head back the way we came, and we should enter the 
Earth Temple themed room. The path here is gated shut, but we can head through this crawl space and into a side alcove. Then roll this bomb to blow up some rocks and do some more crawling. We'll find an underground section like the fire sanctuary had, where we can press this button and open the gate. Now head back to where we came from and pass into this section of the room and battle this Lizalfos. There's a stone tablet here which gives us a hint to hit three gemstones in order from lowest to highest. We'll find a basket statue here which we can toss a bomb into to reveal one of these gemstones. We'll want to roll a bomb down this slope into the lower one which may take a few tries to get the angle right. Then head down to that lowest switch and climb the vines above up to this alcove. You can cut all these trees with some well-placed skyward strikes then use the beetle to pick up this bomb and drop it into the last statue basket. Okay, just remember the hint from that stone tablet and strike the three stones in order. Lowest, middle, highest. This will open a gate which we can head through to find another underground tunnel. You can hit this bomb flower over twice, you just have to be quick, then hit this button to move that same gate as before, which reveals a new path to another underground section. We have to fight a pair of Moldorm here, which just like before, we can defeat by slapping their butts. Once they're defeated, we can emerge at the control panel, and we can open the shortcut gate just like the other rooms here as well. But don't worry about using the control panel itself just yet. Instead, let's head into the next room. This room seems to be modeled after the interior of the giant tree in Faron Woods, and marks the dungeon's mid-boss. This is Dreadfuse, though he may as well be Skurvo 2.0. His attack pattern is identical, except that he's a lefty. Stab him repeatedly to knock him back to the ledge, and just mind the timing of your shield parries. Once he's defeated, we can hookshot across the gap and open this chest to get ourselves a key. There's another control panel here, and you can shuffle some rooms if you'd like, but make sure to keep that green Triforce room there to the left of the current room and head into the door. We should emerge into a room modeled after the basement of the ancient cistern. Fi will remark that that there's an emblem of the goddess Feror in the room, but the section of that room is gated shut. Instead, let's spend that key we just got on the locked door here. This will take us into a sort of gauntlet of combat challenges. First up is a narrow bridge with some moblins. If you're not sure how to defeat these guys reliably in such a small area, here's my tactic. You can dash at them and climb their shields to jump over their heads. They have a pretty slow reaction time, so do this to both, and you should end up behind them. Now you'll have an opening to unleash a flurry of attacks, which, with our fully upgraded Master Sword, should be enough to defeat them right there. Do this to both, and the next door unlocks. This next section has a number of Bokoblin archers. You're safest staying near the door and picking most of them off with your bow. You can head further in to finish the rest of the archers, and you'll have to fight a few Bokoblins with swords, as well as a pair of Stalfos. The next door opens, behind which is a Stalfos with four arms, protected by a swarm of cursed Bokoblins. The zombie Bokos are pretty slow, so I suggest keeping your focus on the Stalfos instead, and if any of them get close to you, just do a quick spin attack to disperse them. As for the Stalfos, again, try to deal as many directional slashes as you can when he leaves an opening, and a properly executed parry will momentarily disarm him, opening him up to attack. Once all the enemies are defeated, the next door opens and we'll find the Mark of Furor. Striking our sword into the crest will transport us into this ethereal room that I believe to be within the sacred realm itself. In this room, we'll find the Triforce of Courage. Hours for the taking. One down, two to go. Now, if you arranged the rooms while in that mid-boss room, then you should emerge through the next door and back into the Earth Temple room. From here, we can once more rearrange the panels. While it's possible from here to arrange the panels to enter this red Triforce room, doing so will only take us to a dead end. So instead, let's do some more shuffling and arrange it so that the blue Triforce room, which has only one door, is next to us here. Then head through the door. We'll now be in a room that plays the sand ship music, but doesn't really share any of the architecture of the ship itself, being modeled more after the Lanera Mines and Pirate Stronghold. There's another time shift orb in this room, which we can carry around and we'll actually find a mark on the ground here that acts as a hint for where to set it down. This will remove this barricade on the wall, which was blocking an eye switch, which opens this gate. Now let's take the time shift stone with us into that hall and set it down so that it's right before this rock barrier that emerges, as that will block our line of sight. Now we can stand on this switch to open a hatch in front of an eye switch, which we can shoot through this ventilation fan. Easy. 
This opens a gate by where the Mark of Nehru is. So let's take the Time Shift Stone and set it down right here so that it causes this stone platform to appear, but also removes this barricade. Hook shot to the ledge and plunge your sword into the crest of Nehru to enter the Sacred Realm again. This time, we'll find the Triforce of Wisdom. Okay, there's only one door and no control panel here, so all we can do is head back into the previous room and use the panel once more. We've been in every room now, but we just need to arrange the rooms so that we can enter that red Triforce room from the east side. It's going to take a lot of shuffling these panels around to do so, and you may even have to arrange it partially, then move to a different room to finish arranging it. That's what worked for me. Entering this room, which is themed after the Fire Sanctuary, from the eastern door will take us into what is probably the most boring room in the dungeon. We'll need to use these water fruit to create platforms and ride the lava flow. There's some switches we need to hit to turn the flow on or off in some sections and then jump to the next platform, which is all well and good, but the current is so slow, so you'll just spend a lot of time standing here. They throw some keys at you to mix things up, but these are keys. They are so easy to deal with that they may as well just not be there. Once more entering the Sacred Realm, we'll find the final piece, the Triforce of Power. Once we have all three pieces, we'll actually be teleported to outside the dungeon, concluding our time in Skykeep. We'll be here on the Statue of the Goddess, just like the start of the game, but now with the complete Triforce before us, allowing us the opportunity to wish on it. With this, we can finally make our wish to destroy Demise once and for all, which is accomplished as the entire Isle of the Goddess is plunged to the surface, with the spiral structure of Skykeep nestling perfectly in the sealed grounds, crushing the imprisoned just as it starts to rise from its seal. The threat of Demise is eradicated. And the Isle of the Goddess just happens to fit perfectly in its spot here, connecting to the sealed temple. We have finally achieved our goals, and can wake Zelda from her slumber. With Demise eradicated, there's no need to keep the seal intact. Groose is happy, the old lady is happy, all is well at last. Except... <laughs> Girahim interrupts our happy moment. He catches us off guard, knocking us aside. See, Girahim realizes one thing. His master demise may now be dead in the present day, but here is the gate of time, and in the past, he lives yet. So, he kicks Groose and the old lady aside, and hauls Zelda back in time, intent on using her as a sacrifice to revive Demise in the past. So there's only one thing left to do, pursue Girahim through time, and put an end to this. <laughs> So, Skykeep doesn't really have a boss fight of its own per se, since it all happens here, but this does take us right into the game's finale, with a series of battles that for the purpose of this video will act as the dungeon boss and allow us to conclude Skyward Sword. First is the Horde battle. When we emerge into the sealed grounds of the past, Girahim will have already begun his ritual to use Zelda's soul to revive Demise. He set up barriers to slow us down and summoned a horde of bokoblins to try and halt our progress. The thing is that with our upgraded sword, we are so much more powerful than at the start of the game, so we can basically swat aside nearly all of the enemies here. This isn't too hard, but boy is it fun to just plow through all of these baddies like this. There's a few instances where they shake things up a bit with other enemies, such as these moblins, but for the most part, we're gonna be just mowing down hordes and hordes of bokoblins. It almost feels like this battle alone was the inspiration behind the entirety of Hyrule Warriors. Once we reach the bottom of the pit, Girahim will get fed up and try to face us himself. He'll raise a platform to battle on, and he reveals his true form to us, a weapon without mercy and full of rage. Our ongoing rivalry with Girahim has nearly reached its conclusion, with our third and final duel against him. And ironically, it's the easiest of the three fights, but I believe this 
to be intentional. This whole section of the game feels like it was designed just to show just how strong Link has become. During the fight, you can slash at Girahim to knock him back towards the platform's edge, then knock him off and deliver a fatal blow to him, leaping to the platform below and plunging the Master Sword into his chest. As you do, he'll take noticeable battle damage on his chest. The gem here is his weak spot. He'll also deliver some pretty direct blows to you with punches and kicks, and he'll try to catch your sword, but aim your slashes between his defenses, knock him down, and lunge down onto him. After a few of these fatal blows, we'll reach the bottom of the pit, but the fight isn't over. Girahim will stand and draw a sword. You can parry his strengths, or what you can do is slash repeatedly at him to literally just knock the sword out of his hand and strike his weak point. After a few hits, he'll summon an even larger sword, but the strategy is the same. You can slice right through his blade and stab him in the chest. This final Girahim battle may be easier than the previous ones, but only to show us just how much stronger we are. The first time we encountered him, he was toying with us, could catch our sword mid-swipe, and was just hard to land a hit on. The second fight was largely the same, but was a far more aggressive battle. But now, Girahim is going all out, and we are able to just slice through his defenses, disarm him, and destroy his great sword. People may complain about having to fight him so many times in this game, but this battle, this payoff, makes it all worth it to me. Once he's defeated, he'll express his frustration one last time at not being able to best us, but then his anger turns to joy. The ritual continued while we dueled and is now complete. His master is revived, and the imprisoned consumes Zelda's soul. The Demon King Demise now stands before us in his true form. Girahim welcomes his master back, and Demise, saying nothing, retrieves his weapon. Yeah, if you haven't figured it out yet, Girahim is a sword spirit much the same as Fi. He is literally Demise's sword. Demise takes a moment to even notice that Link is there, but then, as the hero prepares to stand against him, he finds himself more intrigued than threatened, having never seen a human not fear him. Demise has some fantastic dialogue here, but here's the gist. He challenges you to stand against him, creating a realm for the purposes of our battle. He says he's already waited a millennia to conquer the world, he can wait a few more minutes just to kill us. So this is it, the final battle. Two swords with spirits wielded by their masters in a one-on-one -on -one duel to the death. Visually, I just love Demise's design here. It takes the scaly, veiny elements we saw in The Imprisoned, but gives him a far more threatening air about him. He's cool, composed, and threatening. Also worth noting is the scar on his forehead where the ceiling spike had been. It's a nice touch. He will wield an enormous sword that appears as a dark counterpart to our own. In some ways, with the epic score, the water at our feet, and this sword fight, it does remind me of the final battle from Wind Waker, but this is certainly certainly a battle of its own. Demise will block many of our attacks, but if you're persistent, you can still break through his defenses and even block his attacks with your shield. All you really can do is try your best to get around his blocks and be persistent. After enough hits, he'll switch things up a bit. He'll call down a thunderstorm and use bolts of lightning to charge his sword with skyward strikes. However, we can now do the same, using the master sword as a lightning rod and launching great beams of energy at him. If you successfully land a hit, on him with this, you can stun him with the electricity, which opens him up for attack, though he will also be vulnerable while charging his own sword. Where the battle with Girahim was easy by design, this one, not so much. Demise always gives me a hard time, as he should. He's as difficult as you'd hope a final boss to be, and I love it. It's genuinely difficult to get past his defenses even when changing tactics quickly. He just reacts so instantly. After hitting him enough, he'll be knocked back, allowing us to try a fatal blow. The first will always miss, but try again, and you'll prevail. Link will leap into the air, catching a bolt of lightning with his sword before plunging it into Demise, ending the battle. There's a lot of post-game cutscenes that go on here. Demise curses us, everyone says their goodbye, we leave the Master Sword, the old lady is actually Impa, who stays in the past, and Zelda decides to stay on the surface with Link to watch over the Triforce, founding the Kingdom of Hyrule. So, that's the end. The end of Skyward Sword. We finished the origin story for so much in the series. Overall, Skykeep is a short dungeon, but it serves as a great puzzle-based final dungeon and leads us 
us right into one of the greatest and most climactic finales in the series. While it's not my favorite dungeon either, I can't deny how well it uses Link's inventory and integrates the puzzles found throughout the entire game into one place. And I just love how the dungeon itself is the puzzle. So brilliant. The reused dungeon assets could have been better, but the unique rooms are so wonderful visually, and being able to step into what I believe to be the Sacred Realm and obtain the Triforce, a relic that plays such significance to the series as a whole, is all just so fantastic. Finishing off Girahim and battling Demise is the perfect ending for this game. It's wonderfully cinematic and climactic in all the best ways. I hope you guys have enjoyed this deep dive into the dungeons that make this game so great. We will be back soon with more. The dungeon design of Twilight Princess is next, but that doesn't mean we're quite done with Skyward Sword yet. So stay tuned because next week we're taking a deep look at one more thing that makes Skyward Sword so great, a particular character. Until then, bye bye Thank you so much for watching everybody, I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you to the lovely people who decided to support me on Patreon, as well as my new channel members. In particular, those who supported at the cheese levels or higher, which includes Tetra, Brenda, Justin, Callie, Finley, Grey Mage, Hylian Historian, and Gale. Thank you so much for the support you guys, and I will catch you all next time. Bye bye!